Hey everyone, uh, so I'm sorry about the sound of my voice this week. I am sick, but what's a girl to do, you know? The show must go on, the podcast must go on, and that's that and that's all there is to it. Okay, so what the fuck was this week? Uh, I know that we saw this coming, this Supreme Court decision. I am so um, overwhelmed without words. So I guess I just wanted to take a moment and say, like, it feels weird to do this fun, silly podcast and talk about, like, bad horror movies or talk about rom-coms from the early 2000s. Like, it seems frivolous, but at the same time, this is, like, what I need to survive is just fun content, making fun content. So um, I guess just with that said, please right now go ahead and send $10 to your state's abortion fund. Or um, if you don't know what your state's abortion fund is, you can go look up the national abortion funds. Um, If you go send $10 right now, I would love that. Um, People across the country who need Healthcare would love that. And if you have more than $10, send more than $10. Um, Again, it also feels really empty to just keep saying what everyone else has been saying, which is just like, you know, we feel helpless and go donate money. But honestly, I don't really know what else to say right now. So, woof. Um, Let's take a sharp turn and talk about how much I would love if you would follow us on social media at Did That Age Well. Um, you could also follow me at Molly Birdsmith. But more important than all of that, please write a little review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars and tell us why you love us. And if you don't love us, don't write anything. <laughs> And I know I said a few weeks ago that we had an exciting announcement coming up. That announcement is still upcoming. I can't say exactly what it is, but it rhymes with schmodcast (laughs) schmetwork. So uh, more to come on that pretty exciting stuff. Okay, well, that's enough out of me. Let's get into the episode. Hey, what's up, nerds? Welcome to Did That Age Well. Uh, It's a podcast where my guests and I recap and review movies from the past and talk about how they hold up. This one held up pretty bad, and I cannot wait to just absolutely destroy it. It is so unnecessary to have seen this movie to listen to this episode because so little happens that uh, (laughs) you'll get the gist of it. In the first five minutes of my guest today, oh my gosh, a close friend of the pod, one of the best friends of the pod, I would say, a loyal listener, longtime listener, first time guest. Um, it's Eric Klump and his dog Riley. Welcome to the pod. Hi everyone, how's it going? Hope you're having a great, great day. And yes, this movie did not age well, even <laughs> if all the YouTube videos tell you it has. Yeah, honestly. Okay, so today we're talking about um, Event Horizon, and I kept on trying to find out just why people still like this, because this movie, it's got kind of a cult following today. And I really did, like, I scoured the internet. I tried so hard to find out why people like this. And I still can't figure it out. Like I read some pieces or even just like Reddit threads that were like, this movie is amazing now, but there was like, no, there was nothing to back it up. There was nothing that told me this is why. Did you find anything about why people like this? So I think it's like that weird sub thread of like, toxic gaming and like that type of community and uh they're just like it's the huge like egocentric masculine nerd that like loves like a story like this right and a really corny movie that's like this and like 
yeah, there's some weird connections to some like cult nerddom, like uh, Warhammer 40K, which is probably one of the coolest universes ever. But like, I legitimately don't understand how you could even watch this movie these days and like be scared, right? Like I remember right. watching this movie in college and being like stoned out of my mind. And I was like, this is the scariest movie I've seen in a while. Oh, for sure. And, like watching it now, the special effects have not aged in a way that like even... Are, it's not even remotely scary now like it's just like it's just cringe like non-stop yes. cringe you're like oh man like man I did not think like this movie was going to be that bad but it yeah. is that bad it is and, that uh, bad yeah it's just like woof woof I I was shocked at how bad it was woof is right and I would say Riley agrees as well oh Riley um, Riley does not like people that are uh, misogynistic or like, yeah. like just like anything to do with this movie Riley's like not not a part of like any of those stories and like absolutely a very progressive dog a very yeah, feminist dog did. down for the cause and we need it now more than ever you know so I guess just to kind of go back to give the listener some context um this movie was made in 1997 it was directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, written by Philip Eisner. And we have Lawrence Fishburne as Captain Miller. And I mean, doing a great job because he's good at everything that he does. Um, and then Sam Neill as Billy, who's the direct, uh, excuse me, the designer of the event horizon, the, the ship, if you will. Um, I don't even really know what to call it. <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, it the is ship a, that's a lot. Yeah. It went, it's went to hell. <laughs> that went to hell and back. And there's a bunch of other people in this movie who I am largely unfamiliar with, but people who are probably like 20 years older than me might know what else they've been in. But Anderson turned down X-Men for this. Like he was offered the chance. <laughs> to direct x-men and he was like no i'm gonna make this weird ass little movie about going to hell and back and then he only had six weeks to edit the movie because (laughs) because titanic was coming out like around the same time and they were like okay so actually we have to speed up everything we're going into hyper speed if you will and so we only had six weeks to edit the movie and then within that there were still two weeks of shooting. So it was really more like four weeks. And this movie, it was really heavily edited. And I'm glad because I could not sit there any longer. Like there's this lore about deleted footage that was a lot more gory. And some of it was plot and character development. I don't know if it would have made a difference, but there's sort of this like mythic quality to it because so much of the footage is missing. And I think that people are like obsessed with what's not there. But anyways, yeah, like the screening was a total disaster. Everyone was expecting this like thought provoking kind of creepy movie. And all they got was just like a ton of gore. And then, of course, uh, you know, as we know, it was a complete critical and commercial failure. And that's that. Yeah. And then a bunch of college kids that were probably too high on drugs started watching it and were like, It's so scary. And then it got like this like mythic, like cult of personality. And it's like, I don't even think, I don't think these people have seen this movie in 15 years. Like Probably honestly, not. Like, cause it's like the stuff that they're describing. And it's like, I mean, I just like, as a person that's like grown up out of my like college phases, I'm like, legitimately, how can you find like any of the like, I think particularly what's so disturbing about this movie that like really kind of almost upset me in some ways was like Sam Neill's character and his relationship with his wife. Oh, and God. Like, God, like the element of like the like suicidal imagery and like, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. This like, it's trying to pay homage to like all these like horror movies, but it's like, this is not what those horror movies are about or like sci-fi movies. Like he's trying to do mm-hmm. like a Solaris type thing, but this is like nothing. It's so different from like any of these movies that he's trying to allude to. And it's so much more like a toxic, like I was like, I was like, 
oh man like i can't believe that i like found this movie so like terrifying and i think it was just more it was triggering it's like what yeah. it was actually like it was just like it put you in a state of trauma because it's like yes it's, it's, it's like <laughs> rough so bad like it's like no like this is like not fun to watch right and like I will also say, thank God he didn't direct X Men because, like, that one is shot, shot that like freaking franchise into like. Can you know. imagine? Like, truly, uh, can you imagine? Yeah, I mean, I remember watching that first X Men movie and be like, "This is so rad!" And like, just like, yeah, yeah like just like, oh man. And like, I love Sam Neill in this movie, but it's like, it's like loving Sam Neill for like all the wrong reasons. And exactly. like, exactly it's like so like the dialogue is so corny when there's that like moment where like basically you know sam neil crawls into the space and then he's like subsumed by the ship and its spirit and he's like to lawrence fishborn the ship won't let you leave and then he like oh my god dog. and then like the like the, the the drive starts spinning and you're just like oh my god i know when you say i mean in the beginning when you said like everything is so cringe like it makes me want to use the word cringe less in other contexts because cringe right. is such a perfect word to describe this like everything is cringe because it's not scary it's not good it's just like it's giving Stranger Things if Stranger Things was bad, where there's like this scary villain is not an actual like figure. It's just like the unknown. It's the darkness with a capital D. And that's why everything that like these characters see in the darkness like it can literally be anything like it gives them so much room to just make this like oh it's scary because it's everything that's scary and it could have been really cool and it, then it was so bad like it's trying it's trying so hard to be alien and it's simply not that's no, it it's nowhere near like the amount of like that first alien movie is so scary. It yeah. terrifies you. It still terrifies me. Like I, whenever it's I watch it. It's still so him, scary. Like, yeah. And like, this is like, I mean, talk about like a sweet concept. Like it's such a cool idea and like the way that they could play with like this idea of like, yeah, the ship goes to a space that's like so profoundly evil and beyond what our com comprehension is. But like it comes back and all it is, is like, just like, gross like <laughs> mutilated torture like it's like that's such a like uh, such a small part of like what an actual ship going to hell would be like and mm -hmm. how terrifying it would be and it's like you just like get these like really gross images of like the characters being like tortured in like the most like fucked up like bdsm like type like <laughs> machination <laughs> of like paul ws anderson's like right. weird whatever the hell is going on in his head and i'm just like i'm like dude like god like i mean you can just like you can see the trajectory of his career just like how repeatedly movie after movie after movie after movie is just so <laughs> fucking bad like he like i don't think he made death race but he made the sequel to death race and right. it's like it's like what is like <laughs> why like why do you even have a career and it's just like he gets put on those b-listed movies and like yeah. it's not fun like it's not like the room mm -hmm. or like those fun movies like samurai cop where it's like so bad that it's like actually like really fun and like interesting to watch right he's trying so hard to be good and it's just like he's not all the actors in this movie are actually like long time Hollywood actors that seem like they've worked pretty hard. I really like, um, oh, what is her name here? Let me pull uh, Kathleen class. Quinlan. Kathleen Quinlan's great. And she was like in, um, Apollo 13, mm -hmm. but the woman that plays Stark, Julie Richardson, that character Stark has the potential to be such a cool character. Yes. But, like, like, moment where like, clearly like she should be like that's like somebody that you should lean on as a character to be like the hero right mm -hmm. and like there's like these moments where like 
I just, I don't understand how this drive works. It's too complicated for me right. because dot, 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 I'm a woman is like, yeah, what, it's like, like exactly subtext, like the subtext is. And you're like, <laughs> no, like you're like, you're fucking like, I mean, like other actions she takes in the movie, she's like fucking badass, but it's like, yeah. not, it's not, she's like the only all. one with some sense most of the time. Right. Yeah. And it's like, you know, like the two characters that are the coolest in the movie, Lawrence Fishburne, her, and then like, I mean, really the female characters are pretty solid. They're just yeah. like, the writing is so horrible and they're so typecast in such a small right. box <laughs> that they're like, yeah, you're going to die or you're going to survive. But like your survival is not based on any of your skills. It's merely Absolutely based on not. Like the luck that you just like ended up surviving. And like, right. I just like, oh man, like the like cult status. And I like was actually like talking with a friend and he's like, man, I think that movie's like aged so well. And what? I was like, yeah, well, this is just, this is like classically who he is. <laughs> like he's like, <laughs> he's like a, a monster. Just kidding. Yeah. A little bit of a monster. I don't, I want to go that far, but it is just like, in terms of like him having opinions on certain things, this is like one thing where we're like, I want to raise an argument and have an argument with him. But if we do like, it's going to end up in a screaming match and like, wow, I like riding bikes with him. And right. so like, it's just so, like something that I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to let this go into like off into the other space. And I'm like, but I think he hasn't seen it in like, you know, probably not seven, 25 years. Like it's right. so old. Yeah. Like thinking about some of the horror movies that came out at that time, like oh it's my God. Yeah. so much worse than any of those. And like, I just, I don't understand how the studio was like oh yeah we're gonna roll with this so like we're just right gonna... I feel like okay so to me a lot of movies that are kind of like this similar type of plot line where it's like kind of like I was saying before the villain or the scary force is not an individual but rather like an idea or something that's like very unknown. I think that there was a lot of that going on in the late nineties, like even movies like Blair Witch Project, where it's like the fact that you don't see what the scary thing is, is what makes it so terrifying. And I think that one of the ways in which this movie fails so much is that like they tried so hard to make it scarier by leaning more and more and more into the gore and like trying to make this like body horror chilling experience where I really think that this movie could have been so much scarier if they scaled back and let our imaginations carry it or if it remained mysterious because like that's what is supposed to be scary about it is that like each person's personal traumas are coming up as a result of this journey into hell. And instead of just like, I don't know, letting us get our crazy imaginations out on like a tangent, it shows us in a way that is so over the top that I can't take it seriously anymore, you know? No, it's yeah. And it gets progressively like worse and worse and worse. Like I remember that like moment when you like get to the bathtub and she's like committed suicide and the, all these like images with the eyes. And I remember like being so like, what the, like, right. like just complete shock. And like this time I was just like, gross. Like, I know. Like, I was not, just like, like, not, like, and like, and I think like, I love that idea of like, using your imagination, but also there's no psychological component to like any of the things that he's doing. It's just like, right. you're like, he's just trying to like traumatize you with like effed up right. images and like these things, like talk about like trauma that all these characters are experiencing. Like one guy, like he like decided to kill some of his crew. Like, was that mm -hmm. the right decision, the wrong decision? Like there's so many things that like at their face, the initial thing, like, and how they're experiencing those things and like that trauma that could come up could be so scary. And like, talk about a movie that like some like up and coming directors, like I'm going to remake this and then just like mm -hmm. make it so much better <laughs> than like what he tried to do. Right. With yeah. I can't believe that. Like, I mean, I just like, I can't believe that like, A, like he gets such like an accolade for like making this movie and then B, why, why it just sticks in our mind and our like the cultural consciousness of being this like 
super, super scary movie. And I like, I really wish if you like, if this movie still haunts you, like you should just spend 20 minutes watching it. And then like, Mm -hmm. after you get to that first disturbing image, just turn it off and you like, no, and you'll be fine. Yeah. You'll never have to watch that movie ever again. (laughs) It's like, um, yeah, I just remember picking this movie and thinking like, man, like I, I was like excited because I was like, this movie scared me so bad. Like mm-hmm. I want, like I'm so stoked. I love being scared. I love scary movies. I love body. Like I love everything about horror. And this mm-hmm. is just like, it's like, none of it is fun. Like, it's like, I, yeah. you don't get those moments of like, you know, just like the, oh, or like, you know, like jump scares, yeah. like, you know, there's none of the like profoundly disturbing, like you know, like watching Hereditary, like there's a profound scariness mm-hmm. to that movie where you're like so disturbed and so messed up. And like, it's such a disturbing feeling. And like, you don't get any of that. You're just like, yeah, it's like, I just think people don't know good horror. Like they're just, <laughs> like, they're just like, oh yeah, like yeah, this movie scared me when I was a little kid. I'm going to watch it again. And like, right. it's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand why we experience experience this like this movie has such a cult following and like people love it so much and to me it's like for it feels that all the people that love it it feels like those like toxic nerds that make um that just like make nerd culture like not very fun right like they're like they're like the nerds that like get so offended by like the like marvel universe becoming more progressive and being like (laughs) you know like traditionally like comic characters do need to have like super giant boobs like like, like, the most (laughs) absurd individual ever and it's like oh it's like it's like i mean if you like read like the latest like miss marvel where she's like a young islamic teenager it's like some of the best stuff that marvel's ever done and right it was like open your brain to it it's like phenomenal yeah, I think that's the only reason this movie has a lasting legacy. It's like that that trollish right-wing culture that just thinks like, yeah, this is like what hell looks like. It's going to be like, you're going to like be so tortured. And it's like, right. Oh, I'm like, if hell exists, it would be something that like profoundly disturbs you in like a much and, more subtle way. And not something that you just look at and go like, ew, okay. Yeah, like, yeah, you like, yeah. yeah like. I think what really struck me most about this movie was just how boring it was. It was so fucking boring. I was so ready for it to be over, and it was not even that long. Like, this is not a long movie. They heavily edited it so that they could put us out of our misery as soon as possible. And the feeling that I experienced the most was not disgust, was not fear but just boredom. Like I was just fucking bored. And there are two, okay. Too many characters, simply too many characters for me to be invested in any of them. And a lot of the reviews of this movie actually, like at the time they said that the, what's his name? That Sam Neill's character, that he does a good job of having this like descent into madness that he does a good job of going from like a nice guy to a madman, which to me is also completely incorrect because he always seems suspicious anytime he goes, Oh, it's perfectly safe. And at the moment he said that I was like, there is no way that this is safe. He's super rude to Cooper. Who's like the black stereotype comic relief that of course doesn't age well. And Cooper is like trying to tell this guy, like what is happening? And he's like, you're seeing things. You're so fucking stupid. I hate you. (laughs) It's like, and then it takes them, God, it took them long enough to like, look at the captain's log. And then he keeps, he continues to keep gaslighting everyone. And even with everyone's like the fact that they use each person's individual fears to demonstrate like what this hell experience is like, it still is like, it's too many characters for me to care about any of them, you know? Yeah, I remember the moments of me just like dropping my phone and just being like, oh, I'm going to like cruise Instagram as I'm like watching this movie. Totally. I just like, um, yeah, I didn't know the original review said like it's such a great portrayal of like a descent into madness. 
it's it's like he's so creepy from the start of like Mm -hmm. this is like this is like the evil person that like lures you into your van and then like f's you up like it's not the yeah it's like not the um i don't know i mean I love Sam Neill. I love like all like he's he's just like traveled such an actor and has done so many things. But in this movie, it was just such a like a cringe of just like, you know, trust me, like we're going to go figure out this ship. And like, I don't have any ulterior motives. And like, clearly, like it's like all centered around his weird trauma with his wife and everything. And like the Latin, like the Latin mistranslation is the dumbest it's thing. It's so fucking <laughs> stupid. Like, why? 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 Like, that's such an easy thing to translate, right? And like, I know you could like pull out a Latin dictionary and figure out the difference between the two like translations. These are supposed, like, he's supposed to be a genius, like yeah. genius people. These are supposed to be like the smartest little like space travelers that one could imagine. And they cannot do the most basic translation of a Latin phrase. And then when they realize that they've messed up, it's like, oh, it's already too late. (laughs) That's like, oh, like, yeah, like, I just can like see like Paul W.S. Anderson sitting there and being like, this is genius. Like this translation. And I like, I don't know. Like, I mean, it's like, if like you want that to like be like really weird, like at least like pick like a really weird language, like right. Mayan or something, like something that like yeah, is like, something that, like so esoteric that like you're gonna be able to like make that mistake. And like right. this is just like it's like Latin. Everybody, like if you're a baby boomer and you went to Catholic school, you took yeah. Latin and you would be able to <laughs> translate any of that stuff. And maybe it's just like it's so far in the future that like Latin has just like not aged in a way that like they really know it like I don't know like what the context is to like not know that like and clearly like the way that character is portrayed it's like you went to catholic school and you took like clearly latin you should be able to like you should be able to do the bare fucking minimum and And then it's like that translation right you don't even have to go to the ship like it's like no please see ya god And okay, on that same point about like the Catholicism of it all, there's another point that um, that I read in some reviews about why this is allegedly a good movie. (laughs) And it's about how they tried to use like really gothic imagery, like gothic architecture to kind of fit this theme of going to hell and back. But how is that enough to say that it's like a good movie? How is that enough? It's not. I don't. Yeah, I think, I mean, for the time, I do think like the special effects were probably pretty, pretty solid and pretty, Mm -hmm. pretty revolutionary. And I think like that experience, like it is a shock, right? Like it's definitely like a shock movie and they're trying to shock you. Um, And like, it's like, I don't know. It feels to me like, yeah, like it has all this like Catholic imagery, but like, and it like the way in which people are tortured feels very, very Catholic, right? Like somebody mm-hmm. that's like raised Catholic. And um, I, I'm just like, this is like the worst, like, this is like why everybody hates the Catholic church. Like, <laughs> it's just like very like shame based, like, right. you know, like, you're going to go to hell because like you didn't go to confession right. and like it's like your mom's shame you for not going to confession it's like I right. don't care like yeah. I'm gonna do whatever you're telling me not to because like this clearly upsets you and like it it's the best thing ever and like I did like really like that idea that it is connected to the Warhammer universe and like like Warhammer 40k is like a such a weird cult like board game where people build armies and they like paint them and like make them themselves and like the like iconography of that is like very very catholic but like that like universe is so much it's like way more brutal and like just has so much more nuance to it Mm -hmm. whereas like this is just (laughs) like uh yeah when you go to hell like you're gonna like have your like hand sawed off Right. And like be in extreme pain. And like you're <laughs> gonna like so see much all those, blood. Like, 
it's yeah, so simply much too much blood. Like yeah. it gets to a point where it almost kind of like the shock wears off because of yeah. all the exposure. Like the first couple of gory things, it's like, ew, gross. And then by the time that like Lawrence Fishburne and <laughs> is like in that literal like pool of blood with like blood, yeah. like streaming down waterfalls. I'm like, this isn't even like gross anymore because I've been looking at it for so long, you know? Yeah. And it's like, it doesn't behave like blood, right? Like it's just water. Like you're like, he's just splashing around in water. Like, cold, right. Like, like, I mean, like if you like, if you were like actually like in a pool of blood, like like it's going to be gross. Like, right. Gross. Like blood does not have the viscosity of water. Right. Like it's not going to be this like <laughs> big splashing, like, and like have like, like when Sam Neill's character comes back and he's like all cut up and he's like, you know, like I'm in hell. And like, he's like, right. at that point, you're just like, I don't, like you're, I don't you don't care. scare me at all. Like I'm like, no. wow, you just like, look like you're in some really, really bad makeup. And like, yeah. I really like, just wonder why they allowed this entire movie to like, be like, to get the I know. green light to go into like histories, uh, like the annals of history to be like a movie that was like made. And like, you know, it failed at the box office. And for once, like, that's like a great, it's a great it, shows you exactly why this movie you know like nobody really liked it at the time and i think like mm -hmm. i think it's got a 20 percent like rating on like rotten tomatoes yeah and like it's like yeah it's just bad it's just bad the budget was so monstrous it was like a 60 million dollar budget which was outrageous in that time and in the US, it only made like 25 million. The fact that like the screening was so bad and they like had to edit so much, I'm just sort of like, why didn't they just pull the plug? Why didn't they just say, like, you know what, we're gonna take the hit on this movie rather than like putting it out there and probably, probably the cost of editing it and having like those additional two weeks of production, like. I don't think that those paid off like in, in a commercial sense. Like I imagine that they probably would have saved more money if they would have just like cut it, but I don't know. I mean, Hollywood, just looking at another really bad movie, like Morbius, like they mm -hmm. tried it, I think two or three times in theaters and like, it's bad. <laughs> like, right. I mean, like it's like Jared, like just like Jared Leto being the worst. And like, I right. feel like Paul W.S. Anderson and Jared Leto are like so similar where oh like, my God, yes, they, they think, are like, so, they that is such a great so profound, right? Like they think they're so profound and it's like, like reading about the stuff that like Jared Leto did on the set of, um, Joker. Yeah, or not, a, he wasn't in Joker. Or not Joker, but, the Suicide Squad, where he, when Suicide he was playing Squad. Joker. Right. It just sounded like cringe. Like, yeah. He, like, it's just like, yeah, he sent me a freaking box. I forgot, like, what he did, but it was like, he, like, he sent, sent people, me a box like, dead with, like, rats. Crow. Yeah, yeah. And, like, it was just like, it was like, gross like gross like yeah gross and cringe like I don't yeah. I I don't like I'm not scared I'm not like freaked out and it's not like um when you hear stories of like Heath Ledger as the Joker mm -hmm. on the Batman like it sounds terrifying and he's so totally. terrifying in, in that movie right like it's like that's like the face of real chaos real right evil. like that's like the actual experience and like I can just see like Jared Leto and Paul oh W.S. God. Anderson being like, what we are doing is so profound and we're yeah. so amazing. And like, people just don't get it. Yeah, it's, like, it's everyone else's fault. Yeah, like they don't understand how amazing this movie is. And mm -hmm. like, I like was trying to think of like, the only redeeming thing I can think of this movie is like, um, Lawrence Fishburne like yeah. made made like able to take the absolute like crappiest script and like, <laughs> like a small amount of like I mean it's just like it's amazing how versatile he is and it's amazing how he can take basically anything and turn it into like a pretty solid role and like 
I mean, I'm definitely rooting for him throughout the whole entire movie. And like, totally. You know, like you're definitely like yeah f them all up and then it's like when he dies i'm like i like no i don't even care at all about i don't care what happens to anyone (laughs) no you're just like (laughs) i don't care about the ending like are they on the ship not on the ship i don't know like right i watched this movie six days ago and i already forgot how it ends like i literally forget what happens <laughs> i remember the ending merely because why do i remember the i remember the ending because it was like a big talking point that i wanted to hit on the podcast was oh, yeah. how much the female characters were awesome but like they didn't get anything they didn't like, get anything and so like i remember the ending because like one of the female characters is at the end and then like it's just, like suggested like she gets rescued and then that's like, right that's right she like comes out of like the sleeping chambers or whatever and then she's like oh it's like is she like is she still on the hell ship or is she not right like, it's real and it's like supposed to like i think he was trying to set it up for a sequel right like that's like what it has to be like set up because like right. if he kind of made 15 of these he wouldn't easily made 15 of these like absolutely and he would have thought the entire time like wow i deserve this i am a genius i mean he clearly like with how many resident evils he's made like (sighs) he clearly does like jesus it's like (laughs) like it's like i think i've seen the first resident i've seen one of his resident evil movies and thought wow like i didn't think a movie would be <laughs> any worse and then it's like and it's then it like, gets worse yeah. yeah it gets worse and like just imagine if you had like event horizon 13 like oh my God. awakening of the hell or whatever like no. it would be, it would oh be like oh my god it would just be like it makes me like so sad that like he does share a name with pw anderson because like right? or paul thomas anderson because like talk about like the most amazing like one of the most amazing directors ever right. and like you're like you're like <laughs> just like the complete opposite of like yeah. everything that pt anderson has done and i'm like man jeez i don't know i don't I think there's not much else we can say about this movie just that it did not yeah. do well you don't have to watch it and um, <laughs> unless you have in your mind that this is a really scary movie Go ahead and watch it and prove to yourself that you are a different person and this movie is not scary. <laughs> yeah, it has not aged well. You can like easily move past all that like young adult ho- like trauma and horror that you experience from this movie. <laughs> it's like, I mean, if you're into horror, like go watch like really scary, like truly like movies that like are classics and have aged well and like, you know, really get under your skin because like that's fun and that's like entertaining and like this movie does not deserve to be in the pantheon with those movies you know like yeah. I think like I was glad that um it verified that like this movie like doesn't deserve the time and space that that was in my head like I'm glad right. to, like move past that and be like yes yes like my con- <laughs> like, confirms that PW like Paul W.S. Anderson is the worst. Yes. <laughs> like, I don't have to watch any more of his movies <laughs> or like entertain like the fact that like he's uh, this like expert, you know? Right. Like the best part of this movie is that you can watch it. And when you're done, you can continue living your life. Yeah. Like, like you that's don't the have... best part of it. Yeah, you like, can just like... keep on living your life. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I wouldn't even recommend it for like a cringe movie watch. Of no, like it's not book. even fun, like camp, you know? No, it's not. It's just like, you're just like, oh man, I wish, I really wish that like, I would be entertained if somebody did take this like concept and then run with it in a completely different way. And like mm-hmm. um, made, made a movie that was truly, truly disturbing and really, really scary. Cause like, totally. I do think it is a, really fun concept and i think there's so much like worth exploring in that entire idea and like it also just makes me really happy that like the horror movies that are getting made today are like truly scary and like these young directors that are doing stuff is like they've like clearly are not using this movie as inspiration (laughs) for like we've uh, come so far and thank god for that thank god for that because like for that They used to be like, I mean, these like cringy horror movies are all over the place. And like, I think we're slowly like moving past to where like 
this is becoming like less and less. Like I think even some of the horror that I don't like, like it's not nearly to this level where I'm like gross. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I need to take a shower after watching that Right. Yeah. Like I can't think of anything that was made in the past 10 or 15 years that was this bad in the horror genre. Not that I've seen everything, but like I can't think of anything that was like that bad. No, I can't either. I mean, I think there are probably movies that are like that, but it's like, they're like, you know, it's like the ones that go straight to Netflix and then like. Yeah, they're not getting a a $60 million budget. No, I don't think like (laughs) big budget horror movies, um, you're like really seeing that. And like, I'm glad to like put this movie in a box and let it sail yeah. out to yes. sea and never send it out it. to oh, yeah. send it to hell, you know, yeah, never like, to let be it seen go to again. Hell and like, let him Paul W. S. Anderson continue to make his crummy B-rated movies and like mm-hmm. he'll make another Resident Evil. Oh my just, god, like, of course he will sit on Amazon Prime, like just sitting there like. Yep. Maybe when you're feeling really sorry for yourself and you're at a dark time, you'll <laughs> click on it and then like you watch 15 minutes of it and you'll be like, yeah, he he really is the Jared Leto of directing. He is the Jared Leto of directing. God, that is such that is perfect. That is such a perfect description of him. Yeah. So our feelings on this are very clear. I feel like it is time for us to get into our segment of almost movie trivia. Are you ready, Eric? I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I have a few questions for you about lost or destroyed footage from movies. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. Okay. All of these movies are so much better than what we just talked about. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, question number one, 2001, a space odyssey, uh, after the original premiere Kubrick cut 19 minutes while adding title cards and a small insertion at the Dawn of Man sequence. 17 of the 19 minutes of the cut footage were discovered where? A, on a ship passing through the Panama Canal, B, in a salt mine in Kansas, or C, in his ex-wife's basement? I feel C is the answer, but I could also see A. And I kind of feel this is like, wait, wait, don't tell me, where like the most obvious one is not the answer but the like second most obvious usually is so i'm gonna go a uh it was b in a salt mine in kansas wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's so weird i know i um i don't know how it got there that was where my research ended but i encourage you to look into that further yeah, i'll definitely look into that because yeah yeah <laughs> It wasn't the only movie that I read about being discovered in a salt mine. So I don't really know what that's about. Okay, question number two. During a routine cleaning out of file storage, an animator unintentionally hit a key command that erased all sets in the system, including all of Toy Story 2. They didn't have a backup because the backup system wasn't working correctly. So the film was literally gone. How did they save the movie? A, the supervising technical director who was on maternity leave had a backup program to have files updated to her computer weekly. So she drove her physical computer to Pixar Studios and restored the files. B, they didn't. They had to start from scratch. Or C, an animator from DreamWorks was working on Toy Story 2 as a mole, making copies of the files and delivering them back to DreamWorks. He had a change of heart during the filmmaking process, though, came clean and handed over his personal copies of the files. C. I think it's definitely C. Er, it was A, women uh, saving the day. I just like the, like, DreamWorks, because, like, the DreamWorks animated films that are made at the same time and like the mm-hmm. Pixar movies are just clearly so much better. Right. Like I think pretty much every time. Right. <laughs> like it's I, so yeah, like it's the bugs life and ants. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, or like, was it Jerry Seinfeld was in the B movie that's like yes. so cringe and you're like, oh 
maybe you should just like let Pixar do just that. Just let them do thing. that. <laughs> yeah, like they are so much better than you. Like I just yeah, yeah, the the DreamWorks Disney Pixar feud is one of my favorite things about pop culture. It's so funny to me. It's so petty. I love it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that was I think it would have been really I do fun love if a. That was, I do love A that like yeah she saved the day because like yeah like every situation like the one that's going to be responsible is not going to be like the dude it's definitely always <laughs> gonna be like, you know, like just like knowing my life and like right like my behavior <laughs> like, yeah it's not like if I'm responsible like there's a 80 yeah. percent chance that it's not going to happen yeah and she was literally on leave she wasn't even she wasn't even technically working she was just like Oh, well, you know, I want to be able to keep up with what's going on. So I'm going to have a backup program so that every week, you know, I kind of know what's going on. Like she wasn't even, she wasn't even in the room when it happened. <laughs> she was <laughs> at home. Incredible, incredible. Um, okay. Final question. Number three, the shining originally had an epilogue, but it was poorly received by audiences who first saw it in New York city and LA. We're going back to Kubrick here. <laughs> he thus removed it before the film's release. What did he do with the footage? A, he destroyed it entirely. B, he put it in a time capsule. Or C, he sold it to the National Film Registry, but with the condition that they can only make it available after his death. B? Or, it was A, he destroyed it entirely. It is gone like forever. That's oh, like really gosh. sad though. Cause like there's two, like, so I love the shining, the movie Me mainly too. because it's like so different from the book, but I also love Stephen King. Like I, I think Stephen King is a masterful horror writer. Mm -hmm. And like, I remember, so like I went through this phase where I was like really into horror when I was like from like 11 to 14. And I remember reading all the goosebumps Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like starting that. And then I was like, not scary enough at some point. I was like, this is dumb. So then I started uh -huh. like reading Fear Street and I was like, got my like limit with that. And then I was like, I'm going to the big boy section. And yes. Being, like 12 or 13 and going like grabbing the like Stephen King. And the first one oh I grabbed was Christine. Wow. And like Christine is um, in terms of like Stephen King novels, like probably like not that highly rated. But I remember just like reading that book, <laughs> and being so scared and being like, oh, poor oh, little like, Eric. Oh, my God. Poor little Eric. And like, just like, I remember like, like, I was just such a weird kid. Like, it was like, my mom was just like, why are you like? picking out a Stephen King novel for me. <laughs> like what is wrong with how you? can you how can you carry that you little child <laughs> that big yeah, book like 12 year old Eric sitting there with this oh giant my book God. and like it just like scared me and I like had like I think I had nightmares for like two weeks but Probably, I was also yeah. like this is the greatest thing ever and <laughs> I'm like I don't think I went back and like read it until I was like 15 or 16 but like the exact same experience of being just wow. so scared, but it's I love the origin shining. story. Yeah. The shining is so scary, both of them, but I love how different Kubrick's version of the shining is and like yeah. how he does not care that it upsets Stephen King so much. <laughs> yeah. And to be able to stand up to someone like Stephen King and be like, whatever, I think my version is better. I think that's fucking awesome. I yeah, love it. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Love it. And yeah. Like, that's just who Kubrick is too. Like it's yeah. like he, that he's going to totally do that every single time. Totally. Oh my God. I just remembered that, <laughs> that um, Paul W.S. Anderson had um, this idea in his head when he made this movie. He said he wanted to make it The Shining in Space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, I mean, it's like... Uh, like I mean I was thinking so like Sunshine by Danny Boyle is inspired by Solaris amazing movie like mm -hmm. it's like I mean it's like just like really I think Danny Boyle's like underrated and like this is like the elements of Solaris that he should have taken from he doesn't take from it. <laughs> he like, takes it's like, like 
It's just such a like, I'm like, did you even watch like the film? Like, did you watch? No, like, probably no, not. He did not. He's just like, he just like was like, yeah, I'm gonna like take some like cool sequences that like right. I know like vaguely like it's sort of vague homage to it. And I was like, my God. My God. I, <laughs> I like supposedly Paul W. S. Anderson like teaches like screenwriting. No. Um, and like I just think of um the acting coach in Barry. And yes. it's like oh B-rated, yes. B-rated, like, <laughs> like just like backwaters. Like if you want to get a who movie made in Hollywood, like right. this is and like everybody this- like hates him. Nobody will work yeah. with him. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is exactly right. He's exactly that acting teacher. <laughs> yeah, I, was like, I was like, uh, or no, sorry. Yeah. Eisner. Eisner is a screenwriting coach. Yeah, but he made a lot of bad movies too. Right, and like, and like I just like had that picture. I was like, yeah, you you are the uh, Barry acting coach. Just yeah, like- God, they really both are. Well, anyways, Eric, as we wrap up each week, I would like to ask you um, for your opinion on a trend from the past that a listener has sent us for us to discuss for our final segment: cancel or callback. We have been asked to discuss this week Dunkaroos. What do we think? Like the like Dunkaroos, like the like the snack. snack. Yeah. 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 I, I love Dunkaroos. Like I think Same. It's great. Like I, I think like <laughs> the dipping, the dipping culture, like we do not have snacks where no, we, we dip enough. Not. Like it's like I agree. No, it's like definitely a tragedy. Like we need, I agree. We need more dipping and like more sauces. Like sauces make everything better. Like I think I totally like, agree. Like, yeah. I'm I'm so glad we agree. I think you said it perfectly. Took the words right out of my mouth. The snack dipping culture, let's bring it back. Um, you know, I loved those little like pretzel with the cheese things that you would oh, get yeah. and like a, a, those are so good bring that oh, back. yeah it's such a great like that like fake cheese mm-hmm. bring like, that back yeah it's just delicious like it's like yeah. it's such a like trashy deliciousness like I yes. think like I think we're like too shame-based around <laughs> around like good trashy food like, yeah it's like just like embrace your like love of like the trashy food and I also think it's like as somebody that has like crazy body dysmorphia, but yeah. like I'm trying to learn to like love myself more. It's like, let's just like move past this like whole like shaming around your body and like just like just embrace like who you are as a person and like eat whatever yes. you want. Like I think it's like not gonna harm you in any sort of way if you like, you know, like splurge and have delicious gross snacks, <laughs> you know. In the long I think. Season, Call back Dunkaroos because it is, because it is important. It is important for the body positivity movement to eat Dunkaroos. That's my, that's my take. Yeah. I think 100% I'm fully on, uh, fully on board. (laughs) Eric, so glad that we agree. So glad that we were on the same page about this movie. Um, I am so glad that you were able to join us on the podcast. Do you have any final thoughts or anything that you want to shout out before we call it a day? Um, I think I'm good for today. Oh, there is one thing I want to shout out for those in your audience that love Phoebe Bridgers, that entire crew, like the entire like boy genius crew. There's this Mm -hmm. tiny band out of Philadelphia that's called Saturn S A D U R N. Okay. They're amazing. The record just came out. They're doing like a national tour. Like you should go listen to them. I think they're wonderful. Amazing. Love that recommendation. I think that the the Venn diagram of Phoebe Bridgers girlies and did that age well girlies, it is a circle. So (laughs) sweet. I hope I hope you guys enjoyed that listening. It was such a pleasure doing this podcast. Oh, it was such a pleasure having you. It looks like he might have a little skin infection that I need to get checked out. That would be Riley the dog, not Yeah, Riley the dog. (laughs) Yeah, some issues, but they're all okay. I'm especially okay with him like attacking aggressive, angry white old men. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> it's the responsibility of every dog across America. Yeah. Well, Eric, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Oh, you know, man, oh, you know, man, oh, you know, man.